Welcome back to our study in Acts. We're looking at uh, Paul as he continues between uh, towards, from Malta to Rome. In our last study, the Alexandrian ship Paul had been on was wrecked on a sandbar off the coast of Malta. All hands made it ashore safely in this chapter 28. This is the final part of our story. Paul spent three months on the island healing the people and preaching the gospel. And he and his company will catch a ship to Italy. Verse 28 verse 1 says, When they had been brought safely through, then we found out that the island was called Malta. Brought safely through. This same expression appeared. It was a regular way of stating the idea of passing through extreme danger and still being alive. They have drifted for two weeks without any reckoning of where they were. The storm was so violent they had to take precautions after precaution just to keep the ship afloat. It was a little more than a hulk when they made the final efforts to run her aground. After it struck in the mud bar and was beginning to break up, they had to swim at least the last 700 yards to safety. But they made it, and all 276 were still alive. When all 276 were safely ashore, they learned the island was called Malta. It reads as if it was the answer to the questions of the natives. What is this land called? The island of Malta was originally a Phoenician colony. It was about 20 miles long, from east to west, about 10 or 12 miles wide from north to south. The island is an immense rock of white sandstone with a covering of earth about one foot in depth, which had been brought from the island of Sicily. The name Malita was or given originally by the Phoenicians. <clears throat> it might come from a word which means refuge and be a reference to the shelter that the Phoenician sailors found in this island as they sailed back and forth between Phoenicia and the Straits of Gibraltar. Luke, perhaps looking back on the experience, is saying the island was named well, for he and Paul and the others find it was refuge indeed. As two says, the natives showed us extraordinary kindness, for because of the rain that had set in, because of the cold, they kindled a fire and received us all. Along a seashore, whenever dawn reveals a floundering vessel off the shore, everyone who lives close to the place hurries to the site of the wreck in order to help rescue survivors. The Maltese may even have watched the desperate run for the shore that the ship made. In any case, they are, to play, they are at the place in crowds by the time the people from the ship are wading ashore. There may not have been enough houses nearby to take care of that many people, but they did their best to make the 276 shivering refugees comfortable. It is one of those chilling October or November rains. The plight of the shipwrecked people must have been lamentable. Soaked to the skin, without a thing in the world but what they are wearing and a chill wind blowing. It would take considerable work to kindle a fire out of the rain soaked wood and brush they could find nearby, and it would have to be a huge fire if 276 men are to get anywhere near it. Two would take some work to keep it going. These men were soaked during the swim ashore. The rain was falling, would prevent their clothes from drying out. It would take a considerable help to gather enough wood to keep a large fire like this from going out. He, Paul had been such a helpful person on board the ship that we think it would be natural for Paul to join the natives as they spread over the area in search of more fuel for the fire. He didn't stand by the fire with others had kindled and allow others without his help to keep it burning. He took his turn bringing the wood along with the barbarians and the sailors. Verse 3 says, But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. The snake had been torpid. The viper was doubtless in a bundle of sticks which someone had brought to the fire. When the bundle was laid on the fire, the viper became warm by the heat and ran out and fastened on the hand of Paul, just as he was throwing a bundle of sticks he had collected into the fire. What kind of snake was it? The Greek echnada is a regular word for viper, a very poisonous snake. The poison of the Vespera espis that lives in the Mediterranean area is quite severe. About 4% of all untreated bites are fatal. Luke uses a regular word for poisonous snake. In verse 4 it says, When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, Undoubtedly this man is a murderer, and though he's been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Due weight must be, taken, must be given to Luke's identification of the snake, for as Ramsey as well said, a trained medical man in ancient times was usually a good authority about serpents, 
to which great respect was paid in ancient medicine and custom. <clears throat> the snake fastened its fangs in Paul's hand. Lenski suggests this is God's way of turning all eyes in Paul right from the, the first moment in Malta. That's interesting. They knew evidently that he was a prisoner from the fact that he was constantly guarded by a soldier. The Maltese, in harmony with the typical pagan and mythological notions of the divine government of the world, rushed to the conclusion they were looking at another example of the work of justice. Justice was a mythological goddess whose responsibility was to see that men got the proper justice that was coming to them. The fact the viper had fastened on Paul and that, as they supposed, he must now certainly die, was proof from which they inferred his guilt. We need to remember, <clears throat> calamity besetting a man in his life doesn't necessarily mean he is guilty of some sin, nor is it true that justice is always meted out here in this life. In their mythology, Justice was the goddess of his daughter Jupiter, and was by her duty to take vengeance and inflict punishment for crimes. Allowed is a past tense in the Greek and indicates the natives regarded Paul as already a dead man. A bite from a viper was to them certainly fatal, and they could speak of him as already dead. This was natural enough reaction. The snake will not be able to bite another person around the fire when Paul shook it into the fire. Suffering no harm, ordinary snake bite, there are certain fast uh, aid precautions are taken to counteract the venom. None was taken in Paul's case, nor did he begin to swell up, nor did any red streaks begin to show running up his arm. Jesus had promised the apostles that they would take up serpents and the serpents would not, would not harm them. Clearly the reason Paul suffered no harm is that something miraculous was done, and this produced a strong impression on the natives of Malta. At another time, Paul had been thought of as a god because he worked a miracle. He was thought to be Mercury, the messenger of the gods. Perhaps this time, the Maltese think of one of the mythological gods who was famous for subduing serpents, namely Apollo, quickly jumping to the conclusion that this is who Paul really is. The sound says, now in the neighborhood of that place where lands belonged to the leading man of the island, named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days. <clears throat> Near the place where the shipwreck had occurred, tradition locates that lands belonging to Publius at Civita Vicia, the old capital city of Malta, Malta, located five miles southeast of St. Paul's Bay. The island of Malta is part of the province of Sicily. Since Sicily was ruled by a procurator, a governor, Publius was a legate under the Sicilian governor, leading man was an official title. The hospitality of Publius is extended to a chosen few, among whom would have been the centurion Julius, Paul, Luke, the ship's cap pilot and captain, and perhaps a few others. Publius would have been officially responsible to care for the Roman soldiers and the prisoners, but courtesy indicates the duty was performed in an attitude of gracious generosity. <clears throat> we have to picture arrangements being made by Publius with the inhabitants of the island for lodging for the refugees for the winter months. Begari suggests that many found accommodations in the homes of those in the island whose sick were healed by Paul and Luke during their three days stay at the home of Publius. The saint says it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed afflicted with recurring fever and dysentery, and Paul went in to see him, and after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. A combination of recurrent fever and dysentery would make the case more unusually critical, according to Hippocrates. Malta has long had a peculiarly unpleasant fever of its own, called Malta fever, due to a microbe in goat's milk. A post Paul works this miracle, we see him following the same general course of action as Peter did in the case of Dorcas. Compared to the comments at Acts 20 verse 10 on Paul's actions in raising up Eutychus, the prayer evidently concerned whether or not a special healing must be performed in this particular case. The miracle is done as Paul lays his hands on the sick man. We are reminded of the instructions given in James 5.14. Paul was given miraculous power on this occasion to heal Publius's father. Here is another case where the account of the miraculous is part of the warp and weave and woof of the narrative. Such healing was in accordance with the promise made by Jesus. Both Luke and Mark are simply relating the facts which just happen to be similar. <clears throat> the verse 9 says, When this had happened, the rest of the second island came and were cured. <laughs> the news that Paul, the one whom the viper bit, bites, did not harm, had miraculously cured Publius's father of his very serious sickness, 
soon was spoken about. In consequence, everyone in Malta who was suffering from any physical ailment came to receive a suitable treatment. We're coming. Pictures are continuous stream, uh, stream of people from all over the island coming to Publius' estate to benefit from the Apostles' gift of healing. Luke was able to help. The word heal in verse 8 is hyamoya, while the word cure here is therapio, a regular word for physician's work of heal healing sick. That <coughs> verse 10 says they honoured us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with supplies we needed. The islanders, noting that Paul and Luke had lost all their possessions in the shipwreck, must have presented some very thoughtful and very acceptable gifts to these men, so they were clothed and looked after. The Maltese supplied all the provisions necessary for the comfort for the rest of the journey. The thoughtfulness of the natives of Malta seemed to stem from more than just their sick being healed. We can only suppose there is gratitude to God for the salvation brought to the island by the preachers of the gospel. Verse 11 says, After three months we put out to sea in a ship that had witness with it in, in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. It's now late February or early March of 61 AD 30. The following information is compared in order to arrive at the approximate date of sailing from Malta. The fast, September 23 at 60, had already passed. We are not told how long ago while the ship was still at Fair Heavens. Then 14 days of Acts 27 27, which brought us to the end of October or the beginning of November. Sometime after three months we spent Malta, they sailed to Rome, which carries us to the late date of February or early March. The three months after the shipwreck would have been the winter months, during which the Mediterranean was closed to shipping. It apparently was one of those ships of the grain fleet, similar to the one which had been wrecked. It was the practice of the age to put an image of the person or thing after which the ship was named on the prow and sometimes also on the stern. Luke is telling us this Alexandrian ship had the name Twin Brothers, Gemini in the Latin. <clears throat> Here is another place in Acts where we cross the mythological ideas of the time. According to mythology, Zeus and Leda, the wife of Tyndarus, king of Sparta, had twin sons whose names were Castor, he was a horse tamer, and Pollux, he was the prince of boxers. After their deaths, so the fable goes, because of their brotherly love, they were translated by Zeus into the heavens where they became the constellation we call Gemini. Neptune also wanted to honor them and so gave them power over the winds and the waves so they might assist shipwrecked sailors. Syracuse is on the island of Sicily. 12 to 13 says, we put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day the south wind came up and the following day we reached Putoli. The ship left the island of Malta and sailed nearly due north to Syracuse, the capital city of the island of Scilly. The distance was about 80 miles and would have been a day's journey. Ships bound from Alexander to Putoli commonly put into this port. For three days, the three days may have been spent in transacting ship's business or more probably in waiting for favourable winds to continue the journey. The, uh, from there we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day the south wind came up and on the following day we reached Putoli. We can suppose that the wind was in the northwest, that they sailed east from Syracuse, then north till they were in the shelter of the tour of Italy, and then took advantage of the coast to work their way windward till they came to Regium. Since the northwest was still wind was still blowing, they couldn't proceed through the Straits of Messina and were forced to put into the port of Regium. Arrived at Regium, this town, now Regio, was in Italy on the toe of the boot and was on the southern end of the Straits of Messina. They had to wait at Regium for a suitable wind to take them through the three mile wide straits, but they didn't have to wait long, for a favourable wind sprang up the very next day. The form of Greek verb implies a change of the wind. Such a south wind was what they needed if they were to sail without undue danger between the famous rocks of Scylla and the whirlpool of the Carcades. The distance from Regium to Pillay is about 180 miles. The ship clearly was making good headway before the south wind. Ireland the voyage had taken many days to cover the 150 miles from Myra to Snidus. 
Patrolli, modern Puzzoli. Puzzoli is derived from Latin word for the springs which abound there. The place is celebrated for its warm baths as well as for mineral springs. It's located on the northern shore of the Bay of Naples. Cape Mystium stretches out into the bay on the west side of Puzzoli and forms one side of a smaller horseshoe shaped cove which opens in the south. This was the harbour for unloading the Alexandrian grain ships. The reason they went closer, no closer to Rome is that this was the nearest harbour to Rome that could take the deep draught of these heavily laden grain ships. As the ship came in towards the harbour, Paul would have seen some well-known beauties of the Bay of Naples. The Imperial fleet had its anchorage at, Mis at Cape Missinum, and just to the west of the coast of Cape were the Isles of Esca and Procida. To enter the bay from the south, they would have sailed past the Isle of Capri, and if Paul looked to the east at that moment, he could see Mount Vesuvius and the, cap and the city of Pompeii to the south of the volcano. Since the people of Italy depended so heavily on the grain from Egypt for their bread, the arrival of grain ships was eagerly awaited and welcomed. All other ships except the grain ships were required to strike their topsails as they entered the harbour. The grain ships were allowed to keep their up so they were easily recognisable. The whole population of Putoli went out to see them and sail into the har see them sail into the harbour and celebrate the arrival of more grain from Alexandria. There are Christians in Putoli. Verse 14 says, When we found some believers, they begged us to stay with them for seven days. Then we went on to Rome. How much the teaching of Jesus must have been spreading through the empire is indicated by small notes like this. Who had been the evangelist who brought the gospel here and planted the congregation? We can only speculate. Some people think that Apollos mentioned in Acts 18 wrote the book of Hebrews and they think he wrote it from Puttoli. Stay a week. These seven days, like those before at Troas and at Tyre, would have included at least one Lord's Day. The brethren invited Paul to stay with them, that they might hear Paul teach them. And Paul would have been pleased to have the opportunity to observe the Lord's Supper with these brethren. Verse 14 says, they begged us to stay with them. Then they went on to Rome. That the centurion Julius consented to so long a delay indicates a high degree of sympathy with Paul. Perhaps also, he also had become a Christian. Went on to Rome, preserves a sequence that takes from Ptolemy, verse 14, to the gates of Rome, verse 16, with an account of several delightful meetings on the road between the two cities. Rome was approximately 150 miles from the Apian Highway from Ptolemy. The journey would take them from Ptolemy to Capio, a distance of 33 miles. Here they would come upon the Apian Way, which ran from Rome to Brundisium. At Capo, they would turn north, passing through Formica, Fundi, and Terracini, a distance of 57 miles. At Terracina, they would have to choose between two possible ways to continue their journey northward. They could take a circuitous road around Pontius Marshes, or they could take, take one of the mule-drawn boats down the canal through the marshes. Both routes come out at the Api Forum, in the largest cities. This is about 18 miles from Terracina. From there, they would continue up the Apian Way until they reached Rome. We may think of, great Ape, of the great Apius Claudius, who was censor in 312 BC, planned the road, supervised the building of part of it, and after whom the road is named, and so is the Api Forum. Or we might remember Horace who wrote about the overcrowded canal boat with brawling sailors, the coarse vice and rude revelry and the scoundrel innkeepers at the wretched little town of Api Forum and Horace's Odes. For Paul, however, as he comes up the road towards Rome, his mind is filled with thoughts about how he will be received. Will the brethren there be ashamed of him because he's a prisoner? Will his opportunity to preach there and to share with the Christians he knows be greatly curtailed or prohibited altogether? Entering Rome as a prisoner was not exactly what Paul had anticipated when he wrote to them some years earlier about his desire to visit them. Paul wanted to be helpful, helped by them as he departed to enter a new field of evangelism. 
Thus we went to Rome, Luke writes, meaning after the seven day visit with the brethren at Petoli, the long journey that began with his being grabbed and nearly killed by some Asian Jews. That included two years of imprisonment at Caesarea, the perils of the storm and the shipwreck, now it would take only a few days longer and they would be there. The hearts of both Paul and Luke beat quicker as they began the final leg of the journey to Rome. Verse 15 says, And the brethren, when they heard about us, came from there as far as the market of Apius in three ends to meet us. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. The seven days of Petrola had given ample time for the war to be taken to Rome that the apostle had arrived in Italy and soon would be on his way up the highway towards Rome. <clears throat> now a messenger comes from Petoli saying he's getting close. Two different groups of Roman Christians immediately southward along the Apian Way to meet Paul and escort him back to Rome. Among his brethren we would expect to find Aquila and Priscilla and some of the other Christians addressed by name in the 16th chapter of Romans. Apanetus, Andronicus, Junius, some of the household of Narcissus and others. The practice of going some miles from a city to meet one whom men delighted to honour was a common one. One group of Christians got as far as the AP Forum, some 45 miles from Rome. The other group, group got as far as the three ends, about 33 miles from Rome. The AP Forum was a convenient place for travellers on the AP way to stop for refreshment. That's why it's called the Market of Apius. The day when the Christians from Rome and Paul meet there, the wretched little town, notorious for his general vileness was the scene of a prayer meeting with thanksgiving and praises pouring forth from rejoicing hearts. It has been some time since Paul has heard any words from the brethren at Rome. Would the friends he addressed in Rome and let her welcome him? Or would he have to enter Rome as a criminal with no one to escort him but the soldiers under the command of Julius? Were those Roman disciples still sound in the faith? Or had persecution driven them from their homes? Or had the Judaizers, about whom he warned them in a Roman letter, perverted their beliefs? To questions like these, the coming of the brethren from Rome gave a full and satisfying answer, and Paul resumed his journey with an eager and buoyant hope. Verse 16 says, When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Luke is accompanying Paul from Ptolemy to Rome. This is seen in the house, use of the word uh, pronoun we. Travelling the Apian way from the three ends, they would have come to Africa, Arica, now Arikia, where they would probably have stopped for the night. From that point, as they neared the city of Rome, the Apian way would have presented to Paul and Luke some of the features that modern visitors to Rome still are shown. There were the tall milestones, the stately tombs, one example of which is the tomb of Cilicia, Matala, the wife of Crassus, lining either side of the road and giving the traveller the feeling he is walking through one long cemetery. Then they would pass the cemetery of the Jews of Rome, lying on the east side of the Apian Way, and which has been discovered and explored in the last hundred years. Off to the east too he would see the beginnings of the catacombs, where in later years the Christians, who wouldn't have burned their dead and who were excluded from the cemetery of the Jews, laid the dead to sleep in peace and to wait the final resurrection. Continuing their journey, they would look across about half a mile of land, flat land to the west, and see the pyramid of Caius' sisters near the Ostian Gate. Next, they would have passed through the Apian Gate, also called the Porta di S. Sebastian, which pierces the outer of the two walls around the southern part of the city of Rome. Walking on towards the centre of the city, they would have passed through the Arch of Drusus, and after a while we would have come to the Capuan Gate, which pierces the inner wall. On the right, once through this gate, they would have seen the Selin Hill rise above them. On the left was the Circus Maximus, where in just a few years many Christians would be dying as were torn by the lions. Immediately in front of them was the Palatine Hill, with the Palace of the Caesars crowning its top. Just beyond the Palatine Hill was the Roman Forum. Luke didn't leave Rome, as we see from the fact that he's present with Paul when the letters to Philemon and the congregation at Colossae were written. Those letters were, according to all indications, written from this first Roman imprisonment. The King James Version of this place reads, 
When we entered into Rome, the centurion handed his prisoners over to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. <clears throat> by the time Paul arrives in Rome, the personal services of the Apostles of Christ have been growing less and less important. Many congregations have been established throughout the Roman world. Many preachers and teachers are doing necessary work. There are still inspired letters to be written and preserved for future generations. The inspired history, the inspired letters, the great book of prophecy that closes out the New Testament are still to be written. The personal service presided, provided by apostles has diminished in importance, but the writings will never lose their importance. Apostles live on in their writings, and their authority as representatives of Christ is irreplaceable and never diminish. Two centuries after the last New Testament book has been written, Christianity will replace paganism as the official religion of the Roman Empire. I like to stay by himself. Paul was treated differently than the other prisoners. He was given the unusual courtesy instead of being placed in a common military prison of being permitted to dwell in whatever home he wished, with no restraint other than that having a single guard to guard him. Paul was no ordinary prisoner, brought to Rome to entertain the bloodthirsty cries by fighting wild beasts or the gladiators in the Circus Maximus. He came as an uncondemned Roman who had appealed to Caesar. The presentation of his case in the letter from Festus, as well as a good word from Julius concerning Paul's conduct on the voyage to Rome, contributed to Paul's relatively mild bonds. Paul first retired to a friend's house. Was it Aquila and Priscilla's house? Then later rented an apartment for himself, Bastati. The arrangement where he was chained to a soldier, but yet had the freedom of living in the dwelling of his choice, was technically called Custodia Libera. Paul speaks of his chain, of his being a prisoner, an ambassador in chains. Verse 17 says, Three days later he called together the leaders of the Jews. When he assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. He was hardly settled in his temporary quarters before he begins his missionary activities. Here is Paul, a man now perhaps in his early sixties, growing at a pace that would keep many a younger man hurrying to keep up. In these few hours since his arrival, he has renewed acquaintances with his old friends and brethren who have been requesting more than three years before to strive together with him in prayer to God that he might come to them. Paul, instead of coming as a free man, able to move right through the streets of the city to visit in homes and reason in the synagogues, he had been marched in between files of soldiers, presented to the authorities as a prisoner awaiting trial, trial and was now kept under military guard night and day. Those old friends of his here in the imperial city can be his arms and his legs and help Paul reach out to the masses in the city who need the gospel. In harmony with his regular practice of preaching to the Jews first, Paul immediately begins efforts to contact these beginning with their leaders. The expression leading men would include such people as the rulers and elders of the synagogue. There were no less than seven different synagogues in Rome and the heads of these principal Jewish families that had settled in Rome. We suppose that some of Paul's friends had served as messengers to carry the invitation to the Jewish leaders. They have responded, have arrived where Paul is staying, and now Paul begins his teaching. Brethren, he used the same opening address he used when addressing the leading men in Jerusalem. There would have been several reasons why Paul would have to establish his innocence in their eyes. One is, unless he does, he can hardly expect the Jewish leaders to be able to pay any attention to his message about Christ. The other is that he doesn't need any Jews at Rome putting pressure on the government leaders like against himself, like it had been done at Caesarea. Paul may be a prisoner, but he insisted he had done nothing to deserve such treatment, either against the Jewish people or in violation of the customs that have been observed by the Jews for generations. What Paul is doing basically is disclaiming the substance of the rumours which James tells him has been spread about him. What Paul had done to illustrate the fact that he was willing to live according to the Jewish customs. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. 
To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. Verse 18 says, And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. Paul here summarizes the judicial proceeds that transpired under both Felix and Festus. It's possible Luke gives only an abbreviation or a much longer explanation by Paul of all that had happened between his arrest in the temple and his appeal to the emperor. These words are strictly true of Festus Agrippa, who decided he might have been released if he had not appealed to, to Caesar. Perhaps they are true of Felix too, who we are told left Paul in custody to please the Jews. Was no ground for putting me to death. No Roman magistrate in Judea, neither Lysus, nor Felix, nor Festus, nor Agrippa II, had ever condemned Paul. They could not find him guilty of the things the Jews charged. Paul had used the same expression concerning Jesus as he spoke to the Jews in Pisidian Antioch. Verse 19 says, And when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. The verdict of the Roman authorities in each case was that Paul was not guilty of any crime worthy of death or imprisonment. They wished to release him, but the Jews objected. Paul says, using a very mild word to describe their bitter enmity against him. Festus apparently had determined to free the prisoner, as we have stated in the notes there, but the Jews cried out against it, so that his proposal in Acts 25.9 was made in consequence of the opposition in an effort to conciliate them, or at least meet them halfway. Appeal to Caesar. There is an emphasis on the word forced. I was forced to appeal to Caesar. To appeal to Caesar was something distasteful to, to the Jews, so they turned away from their own religious court and asked a heathen judge to decide their case. It was a surrender of Jewish independence in religious matters. So Paul emphasizes he was forced to appeal to Caesar. It was something quite unavoidable, the only way to avoid being handed over to a prejudiced tribunal, the Sanhedrin, or to the plots of assassination. We'll pick up with Paul again in our next lesson. God bless.